Shaka, what do you think has been the significance of Straight Talk Africa two decades in the making and still continuing? I think that um, the significance of Straight Talk Africa, in my view, is that first and foremost, we have survived. Mind you, we actually went on air for the first time on August the 2nd. 2000. And beyond merely surviving Dugu Peter, the program has, in fact, become a sort of show of record in as far as the African continent and the diaspora are concerned to such an extent in Dugu Peter that it has inspired a lot of youth, a lot of people who can't wait to be journalists and, in fact, become a sort of shakasari. Well noted. Now let's go to Zoe Liodaki, Straight Talk Africa's producer, who takes us on a brief journey down memory lane. All right, stand by. Here we go. In three, two, one. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa. For 20 years, Shaka Sali has been hosting Straight Talk Africa. The first show aired on Wednesday, August 2nd, 2000, and since then, it has covered major developments and trends on the African continent, analyzing socioeconomic realities and ramifications in a balanced and objective way, while providing a platform for the audience to interact with newsmakers. Why should we believe what you are telling us? At the time it was created, many African countries depended on international broadcasters for objective news. And Straight Talk Africa skillfully filled that void. We talk about politics, health issues, elections. We talk about corruption. We had very large audiences in Nigeria, Ethiopia, and there was a need for a program uh, sort of along the lines of call-in shows in European countries and the United States where people could ask questions, could get some context for what was in the news. The idea for Straight Talk Africa television program was groundbreaking at the time. Until then, the OIA African Division shows were broadcast on radio. But this show was going to be aired on television, simulcast on radio, 
and include telephone callers from the continent and the world. The host of the show, Shaka Sali, had been at VOA for a number of years and had the reputation of being an excellent analyst of African issues. He insisted that he would not only interview newsmakers, but also give a voice to the voiceless. We attempt to discuss issues, for example, that reflect the interests of the people. I have contributed once to the show, and I was humbled when Shaka Sali you know, called me back. In the 20 years Straight Talk Africa has been on air, it has produced over 1,000 shows and hosted over 100 guests per year. The program's topics range from politics and security to education, women's rights, environmental issues, civil society initiatives, to efforts to beat Ebola and COVID-19. I never take anything for granted. Each show is a new show as far as I'm concerned. We have nurtured this tree and developed a program that develops intellectual curiosity of the continent and demystifies the stereotypes about Africa. Straight Talk Africa often takes an in-depth look at initiatives of the diaspora to aid Africa and focuses on how chess and art can inform social change. Shaka Sali has interviewed many African leaders during his two decades helming the show, including former Liberian president Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who was also the first elected female head of state in Africa, Kenneth Kaunda, the first president of Zambia, and Lazarus Chakwera, the current president of Malawi. And I look at myself as a servant of nothing but the truth, a servant of issues, not a servant of personalities, not a servant of ideology, not a servant of politics. Generations of Africans have grown up watching, listening, and interacting with Shaka and his guests. He provides a meaningful forum for the political truths taking place in their countries. Many fans talk about the Straight Talk Africa University that gives free lectures every week. When my dad used to tell us to watch your show, when he's back from work, he's going to ask us questions. That helps me to learn more stories of Africa and also to know other places as well. Straight Talk Africa is destination viewing and listening. And after two decades, the program continues to leave an indelible impression on Africa's ever-changing political and social landscape while providing a blueprint for younger generations of aspiring journalists. I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you for the first time on Straight Talk Africa. Zoe Liudaki, VOA News, Washington. Well, Shaka, what an amazing career. I want to go back to the show uh, when it started. At the time, you were a respected radio co-anchor of English to Africa's flagship program, Africa World Tonight, and an analyst on the World Net television show, The Africa Journal, hosted by VOA's Maimuna Mills. Why wasn't this enough in Lugushaga? You know, the media landscape on the African continent was changing tremendously. It had for years been dominated by state-controlled media. There were only a few countries, perhaps like South Africa. You could probably talk about Kenya. You could probably talk about the Republic of Ghana which had independent platforms. So I really felt that um, since the African continent had recently opened up, there was a void that needed to be filled by a program such as Straight Talk Africa, which, by the way, was triggered largely by the fact that uh, when I was doing my graduate work, at UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles, doing history, film, and cross-cultural communication, I discovered how important 
oral traditions were when it came to African history. In fact, none other than Alex Haider himself, the author of the best-selling uh, Roots, and of course uh, the autobiography of Marco X, he had traced his origins, his roots, from the Republic of the Gambia by following through the process of African oral traditions, going through the griots and all that kind of stuff. So I felt that there was a need for a program for Africa where people would be free, for example, to interact and in some cases, in fact, have unfettered access to their own leaders, including their presidents, including their prime ministers, their ministers, their, you know, their ambassadors, their chief justices, their bishops, and you name it. And you know, it worked. Because at one point, as a matter of fact, we received overwhelming reaction suggesting that Straight Talk Africa had, in fact, in their view, not mine, succeeded in becoming what they characterized as a pan-African sort of parliament. Mm. That was before the, actually, the, the establishment of the pan-African parliament, which is best in Midlands, South Africa. Now let's take a look at what VOA management thought at the time about Shaka and how Straight Talk Africa was born. I met Shaka at the University of California, Los Angeles. I hadn't heard for Sh from Shaka for like six years. He called me one day from New York and he said, uh, hey, Greg, you know, I'm interested in working at the Voice of America. It so happened I had just been chosen to head up the English to Africa service. I spoke with the division director. So Shaka came in, we had lunch, and after that lunch, the division director said to me, we got to hire that guy. He is so good. Live from the Voice of America headquarters here in Washington, I am Shaka Sali. Straight Talk Africa was created just at the turn of the century, from the 20th to the 21st century, right in that period. And uh, VOA was becoming increasingly popular, increasingly relied upon on the African continent. You have to remember at the time, throughout uh, much of Africa, there was no independent uh, broadcast media. People depended on, on uh, international broadcasters for so much information. Shaka has played a tremendous role in the last 20 years by trying to bring civil political discourse with the opposing views. He has brought actually government officials and opposition leaders to the table to discuss issues, governing issues of the country. So I would say that it's not only informing people, educating people, but also Shaka has helped also to establish a new culture, that means civil political discourse. Shaka was in some ways a sort of transnational African person. He was somebody who uh, achieved what some people might have regarded impossible at the time, but, but a sort of African identity, not just a particular national identity. And he was able to get people to talk with him as a result. He has uh, interviewed high-profile head of states, uh, political activists, opposition leaders, NGO leaders. I remember now uh, Paul Kagame of Rwanda. I remember Yuri Museveni of Uganda. I remember the late president, Mr. Atta Mills, who gave him the interview straight talk from Ghana State House, from the palace. These are all Shaka Salis at And you could see in the way that the audiences just grew. All our research was telling that. He was able to draw information out of people that not everyone would be able to do. They trusted him. His knowledge of Africa, his reality, his sensitivity to African issues. More meaningful information to Africans all over the continent about what was happening there. This anniversary is a great anniversary. It's a recognition of Shaka Sari, his greatness. An incredible, well-versed, 
highly skilled journalist as well. I congratulate him and I congratulate also every producer, line producer, every team in that state of Africa should be also congratulated. It's the greatest achievement. In the last 20 years, what has been some of the key highlights of Straight Talk Africa? First of all, uh, Ndugu Peter, that is a very, very important question. You cannot believe that right from the birth, right from its inception, the impact was incredible. For example, I recall in 2002, hardly two years the program had been on the air, Ethiopia and Eritrea were fighting what uh, former US President uh, Barack Obama would probably characterize as a damn war. Brother fighting brother for a piece of sand territory called Badme. And the international community had somehow, the tribunal, ruled, you know, in favor of one over the other. So we had a program, and two ambassadors, each of them, of course, being plain potential and extraordinary. There was the ambassador representing Ethiopia. There was also the ambassador representing Eritrea. And as we discussed, the Eritrean ambassador seemed to be more effective. This man had, by the way, before the rebirth of Eritrea, had been an Ethiopian soccer megastar. And now he was Eritrea's ambassador to the United States. Suddenly, there was a call. And the caller on the other end, calling from the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa, said his name was Abebe. And listening to him in my ear, I had someone very unusual, someone remarkably articulate, remarkably authoritative, remarkably confident, and essentially he was talking about how, for example, the Ethiopian ambassador did not seem to represent the reality of what the tribunal had ruled. Would you please ask the ambassador to show you, on the basis of the black line, where Badme is, and if Badme has been assigned to Eritrea on that map. And you know what? The Eritrean ambassador, who had actually been a freedom fighter also, and had been, in fact, with Meres Zenawi, who happened to be, at the time, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, said, that is not Abeba, that is Meres Zenawi, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. This man was watching us live from Addis Ababa. At the time, we were basically going global live via SABC, the South African Broadcasting you know, Corporation in Africa. Satellite could take us all over the place. So such was an impact. A, a whole prime minister of Ethiopia, which happens to be the second largest country on the continent after Nigeria, mm -hmm. with a population of more than 105 million human beings, he was calling from Addis Ababa to Straight Talk Africa. Interesting. And talking to the Kavali kid, a kid that had really been an obscure type of kid in Kavali and had walked to Washington, D.C., and had now become an international, really sort of household name, especially in Africa and the African diaspora homes. And then there was also another case. We had a program on Nigeria. Mm -hmm. The key host on the program was the Nigerian vice president, 
Atiku Abubakari. He was vice president of uh, General Orushegun Obasanjo, retired but certainly not tired, who was then president of Nigeria. We're talking about uh, essentially 2000 when the program had just actually come on air. And he was asked by some Nigerian audience talking about how since the end of the civil war in Nigeria, the Igbos who had failed, of course, to sustain uh, Biafra, which they had declared their homeland, he had said were being discriminated against to such an extent that even after 30 years of the war, there was not a single Igbo general in the Nigerian armed forces. You cannot believe, Ndugu Peter, that within two weeks, even though the vice president was claiming that they were Igbo generals, and when I asked him, could he name one, two, or three specifically, he couldn't. You cannot believe that within two weeks, Abuja, the capital, appointed three Igbos to the ranks of general, brigadier general, major general. That was, such was the impact that came with Straight Talk Africa. Meaningful impact. Well, during your 20 years on the helm of the show, you have worked with a number of producers. We caught up with a few of them. Welcome to Straight Talk Africa. I like the host of the show. Chaka is a gentleman and a scholar. He was a very knowledgeable person, first and foremost. Shaka likes in-depth conversations, conversations based on facts, and he doesn't like polemical debates. Being able to use leaders of many different countries that Shaka could pin down, a president could be seen anywhere in Africa. And when it comes to asking the tough questions, he's not afraid to do that. Is that something that you could even remotely think about? Our constitution forbids it. I thought I knew a lot about African politics and the, the nuances of, of, of it all, but Shaka, he knew it all. And uh, Shaka uses facts, uses the historical context of a situation to get as close to the truth as possible. We had the voices of everyone, the scholar, the politician, the NGO, and the most important voice, we were including the voice of the audience. It wasn't just Africans in Africa who were calling us, it was also people from diaspora. Many times we got calls from London, from the Netherlands, from Greece even. So Shaka helps people connect with their history and also understand their rights. In the meantime, get better, not better, Africa. Oh, Shaka had some Shaka-isms. When he was interviewing somebody and they weren't really quite telling the truth, or as we say these days, they were giving you fake news, Shaka would turn to them and say, is it, was one of his favorites. And then he'd say, really? And then would come the killer questions. My favorite Shaka-ism is the president and the government are employees of the people. It's a perfect phrase. It talks about socioeconomic justice and respect to human rights. And it applies to any country in the world. The greatest friend of the truth is time. Her greatest enemy is prejudice. And her constant companion is humility. So I think it encompasses everything about him, the show. And I just think it's the best statement that we worked on on our work ethic to bring the show together every Wednesday to our audience. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive. And now, Shaka, in addition, Straight Talk Africa, you have another weekly show, Shaka Extra Time. Tell us about the show. Basically, uh, Peter, what triggered that show, and you are talking about, of course, uh, the Shaka Extra Time which is hosted by my colleague, uh, Paul Ndiho. That show was 
triggered by Straight Talk Africa, there was a gentleman who sometimes I'm tempted to say um, qualifies, frankly, to be one of my mentors in television journalism, the late Bob Long. I'm sure you knew him. Yes. Bob Long at one time was uh, in charge of uh, NBC television in this city, Washington, D.C., and Los Angeles, the city of the angels. Bob Long came to work for the Voice of America as one of those uh, uh, senior program reviewers. As he was reviewing various television programs out of this building, he came across Straight Talk Africa. And being a television man, by the way, he had served in the US Army as a captain, and I had also served in the Ugandan Army as a lieutenant paratrooper. So I used to defer to him. I used to call him Captain Long. <laughs> he, would say, he would say, well, uh, go on, lieutenant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bob reviewed some of my programs, and he reached one conclusion. He said, first of all, in his words, not mine, that Straight Talk Africa was probably the best program that came out of this building. It connected with the audience effortlessly. And he said the reason was because of the host. And he said the host had three things going for him. He was, first of all, informed. He was authentic. And he was sophisticated. And so he actually suggested to the VOA senior management that the VOA did not seem to understand the sort of intellectual diamond that it really had. He actually said that uh, they were underutilizing Shakasari. He was an admirer of a great journalist at the CNN at that time called Anthony Bourdain. You know this guy, he used to go around and yes. eating food and all that he, kind of stuff. And he, he, was he was a, a chef great too. guy. Right. Yeah, he was in fact uh, uh, a household name globally. Mm -hmm. So Bob envisaged Shaka Sali becoming a VOA sort of Anthony Bourdain. When that, that didn't work out, he basically sold the idea of having a sort of program where Shaka, every week, would get an opportunity to interact with his audience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, explaining some of the things, for example, uh, that had been on previous, you know, straight talk shows. And, um, providing some kind of solutions to some questions. And you can't believe it. That program has actually been on air for eight years. It started largely as a, a sort of, uh, you know, a sort of social media. We basically go live via internet every Tuesday. And you cannot believe how many television stations have since picked it up on the African continent because it is an, it is an incredible demand. Mm. So my friend, that is how the Shaka Extra Time was born. Mm. Some of the reaction has been suggesting that, uh, you know, there are students at universities who have actually been watching Straight talk, of, I mean, watching Shaka extra time. And simply on that basis, they have sort of characterized it as a sort of university where you don't need to pay tuition. <laughs> 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 Some people have actually told me how they got first class degrees 
based on the knowledge they interact with via courtesy of Shaka, etc. Mm. Wonderful. You are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of our discussion with Shaka in a moment. So stay with us. I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to have the opportunity to host the three of you on Straight Talk Africa. Time happens not to be our best ally. Time is not our best ally, Dr. Riyak Machar, yes. because apparently there is, no there is no democracy in Studio 52. If your producer says to go, you have to go like storage. In the meantime, get better, not better, Africa. And please remember, and please remember to keep the African hopes alive. Well, Shaka, your producers a little while ago were talking about Shakaism. What are some of the Shakaisms that readily comes to mind? You know, first of all, as a young kid, mm -hmm. high school kid, I was attending Shigezi College of Toveri in Kavari. It was a very, very good school. It was very difficult, actually, to gain admission there. But once you got there, if you did not like the sciences, like physics, chemistry, additional mathematics, and stuff like that, you realized immediately that you were in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. It was like a department of science and mathematics. Right. And there were so many smart kids. So one day, I had this professor of mathematics, Ero Coven. He was from the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. I had also been uh, an athletic superstar. I used to do 400 meters hurdles, mm -hmm. triple jump. I used to do 400 meters relay. And I have also have used to be the striker as one of the members of the first 11 of the football team. Mm -hmm. I used to be so good that sometimes, unless I was in the lineup, the school wouldn't score. Mm -hmm. So I took it, I, I basically focused so much on sports. And I was interested in the, what was described as the arts, right. which did not seem to have a place there. So one day, I am in a mathematics uh, class, and Mr. Coven looks at me and says, you know, you may be, you may be faster than your colleagues on the track, but I can assure you, based on your uh, uh, abilities or lack of abilities of mathematics and sciences, I do not think that you will end up as anybody. And so, for that reason, I started developing some interesting shakisms to reflect, for example, how that statement really challenged me. On the face of it, it looked like it was a very negative way of looking at you, mm -hmm. and that you could probably lose hope in yourself. On the contrary, it actually inspired me to be the best that I could be at whatever I liked. So one of them, one of the shakisms for that reason, is the best revenge is massive success. And I think that uh, wherever Mr. Coven is right now, mm -hmm. if he were to be watching me or listening to me, I am that young kid who was at Chigezi College of Tobere in the 1960s, who he thought, at least in his view, not mine, that I could not end up being somebody. Mm. Interesting. Uh, then, of course, uh, there's another one. It says, all of life is about passion, mm -hmm. action, and reaction. To ignore 
the passion, action and reaction of your time or your generation is to risk having not really lived at all, occupying space, Dugu Peter. I am glad I never occupied space. Well put. Over the years, you've had a number of guests that often return to appear on the show. We caught up with several of them. I cannot believe it's already the 20th anniversary of Straight Talk Africa. Absolutely amazing. Welcome to Straight Talk Africa. I am Shaka Sali. VOA Straight Talk Africa has done exceedingly well to cover contemporary issues, political, economic issues, social, cultural issues that are taking place in Africa in a timely and fashionable manner. Uh, and I think it provides a platform for a really fair and impartial, objective uh, sense of things uh, on the ground in Africa. The show is an icon. It is the marquee show for African affairs. It gives an expansive understanding about African politics an African future. Well before social media became such a thing, uh, Straight Talk Africa was there with interactive media, with audience participation, with fresh up-to-date news analysis and information. In a lot of these dictatorships, the chief executives not only controls the executive, but actually controls the legislature and the judiciary. That's a very good point. Whenever I'm with him on the show, it's, it's just amazing working with Shaka, you know, his depth of uh, knowledge on issues, his knowledge on factual developments on the ground is just incomparable. I'm grateful because I believe, uh, as I've been promoting a new dispensation of Pan-Africanism, Straight Talk of Africa gave me some exposure. I was in the airport in Kenya and someone came up to me to say, I know you, I saw you on Shaka show, and we love Shaka. So you recognize that people all over the world, they know him, they trust him, he is honest, he has integrity, he's seen as someone who can speak truth to power, and he's done so consistently for two decades and more. How will I describe Shaka? Shaka is an international treasure. He is a gem. A consummate television personality of incomparable standard. He contributed uh, to uh, elevate the consciousness of Africans and he is a true son of Africa. That is how I would describe Shaka. Well, Shaka, I want to go back in time and talk about the kid from Kabali. But before we do that, I want us to hear from your number of fans uh, from your hometown and beyond. The interesting thing about him was that unlike people like me and many, many others, he did not follow the way things were supposed to be. He, in many ways, was marching to his own beat. And this, of course, in a very conservative society like Uganda at the time, was alarming to our parents. But we, the young people, secretly admired him because Shaka was always into the movies. And Shaka, uh, of course, he quit school, high school, and joined the military. And this, uh, our parents thought this was the worst thing a person could have done. And uh, they, in fact, even warned us not to associate with him because he would be a bad influence. Uh, such was the conservative society in which we lived. But of course, uh, time has proved him right. And what I like about Shaka the most, he always has, always has time for his fans, whether they're you know presidents, ministers, or just a plain shopkeeper, he treats everyone the same. So that's the great thing about Shaka. He, you know, everyone's treated the, the same and respected the, the right the same way. So it's nice to see that. So Ndugu Shaka, you dropped out of school and joined the army. Why the army? Because 
it was probably the only institution at the time that would help me realize something I came to like and admire so much when I was very, very young interacting with Hollywood via cinema. They call them movies here in the United States. We call it cinema. And I think it is the same thing, actually, in London. I fell in love with the cowboy genre. I liked the Duke, John Wayne. Mm -hmm. I liked Jean Autry. I liked Clint Eastwood. And I liked Jimmy Dean. And Jimmy Dean especially because you cannot believe this. Even if I had the power to write a script, I could never have done that because many, many years later, I end up at UCLA, a world-class film school, among others that has produced Jim, Jim, Jim Dean, a guy who was supposed to be a rebel with a cause. He actually went to that same film school. Francis Ford Capola, a guy, of course, who brought us the sequels of The Godfather. Mm -hmm. We basically pretty much breathed the same air in the same building. We basically enjoyed the sculpture garden on the incredibly beautiful campus of UCLA. So when I liked those cowboy generals, or the spaghetti westerns, as they are called sometimes, I also liked the pistol. I liked the power of the grenade. Those types of things. I liked the stunts. When I look at uh, the cavalry where I was born and grew up, there was only one institution where I could have unfettered access to some of those gadgets. It was the military. And I was, as I told you, an incredibly good athlete. And so the military was terrific. And frankly, I am glad that I actually made that detour. Because I do not believe, frankly, that uh, the shortest distance between two points is a straight, straight line. line. It's a detour. And frankly, I am here interacting with you Ndugu Peter, perhaps precisely because I made that detour. It is the military that opened my eyes, that made me grow. It taught me that you either have to self-destruct or grow up. And I'm glad that I chose the latter. But, but it look helped at... me. I was a sort of adventurous type of guy. Mm -hmm. But I was also equally fiercely independent-minded. Mm -hmm. That second quality is something that could not quite possibly be tolerated in an institution such as the military. Mm -hmm. But I was in the Army as an officer cadet for training for two years. And boy, did I grow up. I met so many different types of people people who had dropped out of universities, people who had legitimate university degrees, people who had gone to different universities, schools abroad and what have you. And I was very young. I was almost doing catch up, you know, every time I could think about it. Mm. I wanted to be like some of those people. I remember asking an Israeli officer cadet one time, I said, what did you do? to be so smart. You are so smart in class. He said, books, books, books. <laughs> but you know what? If someone suggested that I was perhaps a remarkable case of a second birth in one lifetime, I wouldn't deny it. Mm. Now, Shaka, we reached out to your viewers and fans on social media and told them we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of Straight Talk Africa. 
We were inundated with comments and videos. Let's take a look. I like the matter, the way in how you press your panelists on Straight Talk Africa, the way you introduce it. Hello, this is Straight Talk Africa. I started following this program, I was a very young man, but I've been following you on how you're doing your things. So you are a good example of moderators doing such programs. You have enlightened many Africans and have opened our eyes to know a lot of what is going on in the world. You enlighten us about the crisis in uh, West Africa, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Nigeria. You also enlighten us of the natural disaster. I enjoy your program. It tells us about what is happening in Africa in all aspects of life, economically, socially, and politically. And also it uh, tries to uh, suggest the possible solutions to the challenges and the problems that are facing Africa. Shaka, first of all, you inspired me to go to Gezi College of Utovere. And Shaka is a uh, grand lot of things. We have united Africa by using some of your words saying, keep Africa hope alive. I remember that the VOA's Straight Talk Africa was one of the reasons I had to get my own short wave radio then as a student. And I must say that indeed I've been enlightened. I'm also encouraged by the passion and commitment with which Mr. Shaka Sali anchors the program, which has made me glued to the Voice of America from 2002 till date. It's a hammer that hits the nail on the head, straight into mend the issues in Africa. And I love Shaka Sali just because he's always straight on the point when he brings a guest in the studio. Uh, this last 20 years of, of service on Straight Talk Africa has been so... Uh, evidential and has certain that Africa voices can lead to its development. Was a Shaka influence to African leaders and even the youth here in Africa, one day, one time, Africa will be peaceful and my country, South Sudan, will, hold, will also be peaceful. Let me use some of your words that you use at the end of your show get better, not bitter, and keep the African hope alive. Well, so, Idugu Shaka, looking at your background, what really triggered your interest into plunging yourself into journalism? After all, you could have been comfortable. You were in the army. You could have been, you know, made a lot of money, traveled around. What made you plunge yourself into journalism in the first place? What triggered it? Well, first of all, as I told you a little bit earlier, I was um, this sort of kid that was very adventurous. I honestly liked having a good time. And I used to like the army, especially when I became uh, a paratroop lieutenant with my wings, very, very dapper uniform and stuff like that. And I would on occasion drive some sports cars and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, go on very good dates, go to good restaurants, go to movies, and you name it. Drive in cinemas and stuff like that. So what happens is that uh, along the way, I also sincerely became socially and politically conscious. Because being in the army, you begin to understand clearly what a government is or a government is not. And it so happened that while I was in the army, there was a military coup, which essentially brought General Idi Amin Dada to power. And for the first time, I started questioning whether in fact it had been a good idea to begin with to be associated with that type of institution, which was abusing power, uh, which was um, torturing, intimidating, and in some cases, really, uh, killing innocent civilians. Killed many of my, of, you know, officer, cadet, you know, uh, colleagues. Killed many of my uh, officer colleagues. You know, the army gives you an opportunity to bond. To be honest with you, ever since I left the army, 
and you are talking about uh, really almost five decades, life has never been the same for me. Mm. I one time, in fact, described uh, how I felt to a former president of Botswana, mm -hmm. Lieutenant General Ian Kama, mm -hmm. Kama, retired but not tired. Mm -hmm. He asked me when I was just before I interviewed him that ideally what would I have liked to do? I told him that uh, if I had been born and grown up in a democratic society, I wouldn't have minded being a general. <laughs> but then I said, since I wasn't, I think the best thing that could ever happen to me is to be a journalist. Mm. And part of the reason, frankly, is, again, keep in mind that I was a very adventurous guy, very fiercely independent-minded. I also liked to travel. I like to see places, mm. but I did not have that kind of money. And I was not really good at making money, and I never even wanted to do it. I don't like business, even though my father was a successful business person. It is my sisters who have actually ended up borrowing that leaf from my father, and they are success some are successful entrepreneurs. But I also borrowed a leaf from him which was somebody that was interested to know what was happening in his surroundings. Mm. He had bought a radio earlier, Pi radio, with earth wire, transmitter, a huge battery, like a, like a block. I always sat by him on the fireside, listening to the news as he listened. And so what happened was uh, I felt when I sort of grew up, that the best thing that probably could really happen to me is for me to be a journalist so that somebody or some, you know, big institution could be kind enough to hire me so that I could use its money and resources to go around the African continent and indeed the world. And that has happened. In fact, to be honest with you, I can tell you from the deepest, better part of the bottom of my Kabale heart and soul that I am so lucky that the Voice of America as an institution pays me for doing something that I would probably do for pro bono, something that I would do as a hobby. You earned a doctor of philosophy degree. However, you pretty much don't like using it. Some mm. people will call you Dr. Sh Dr. Shakasali. You don't want to be called Dr. Sh Sh Shakasali. Why? Well, first of all, what is beautiful about it is that, as you put it rightly, it is an earned doctorate degree. Mm -hmm. I have the rights and the full privileges of the University of California to call myself legitimately Dr. Sally. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's not the salutation that makes you a doctor. I honestly feel that at the end of the day, what I do, so long as it reflects the training that I acquired, that is good enough. Because I grew up in an environment where the only person you refer to as a doctor is a doctor with a real clinic. Someone that treats people when they are sick. Mm -hmm. And so I can imagine myself back in my Kavari setting, you calling me a doctor, and a kid suffering from malaria or whatever it is, and the mother would immediately run towards me and say, Doctor, 
could you please make a difference here? <laughs> <laughs> so that's part of the reason. Mm. And guess what? Hosting this program, Straight Talk Africa, has also really helped me in many, many, many different ways. It has educated me. It has liberated me. For a kid from Kavari who used to suffer from what I call intellectual kwashako, mm -hmm. that kid came to the United States. That kid lives and has a platform originating from the de facto political capital of the world. Mm. This is a place, whether you like it or not, where some of the decisions that affect all of us globally are made. Mm. So I'm proud of that fact. And also, I think here I should say that I shall always owe a huge, profound debt of gratitude to the American people for having given me the infrastructure, the educational infrastructure mm -hmm. that has helped me from being an obscure Kavari kid to a household name in many, many African and global homes. Mm. Indugu, for 20 years, you've hosted and managed Straight Talk Africa. From its inception or when it was conceptualized, how have you managed to keep it for two decades and still running strong? First of all, I have to say that uh, I am not a very spiritual person. Mm. But I sometimes think that uh, when somebody says that you are blessed, maybe there is a point. Right. But one thing I can assure you is that uh, for me, when it comes to Straight Talk Africa, I remember the first interview that um, I received just before the first edition went on air. The journalist uh, you know, asked me, what will it take for you to consider yourself a successful host of Straight Talk Africa? I remember immediately, spontaneously, saying that if I could first and foremost remain authentically Shakasari, the kid from Kavari, I would have succeeded. And frankly, I think there is abundant evidence to suggest that we have succeeded because we are still alive. You cannot believe how many doubting Thomases we are there. And so what happens is that uh, I basically see myself essentially in the audience. And the audience apparently also happens to see itself in me. So we resonate. That is the secret. Well put. To conclude the celebration of the 20th anniversary of Straight Talk Africa, it's my esteemed honor and pleasure, distinctly, to call on the indefatigable host and managing editor of the show, Shaka Sali, to sign off for us. Thank you so much. Get better, not better, Africa. And please, please remember to keep the African hopes alive.